love to introduce our first speaker for the morning, who's Associate Professor Denise Jackson, Jackson, who's a visiting fellow from Edith Cohen University in Western Australia. Associate Professor Jackson is the Work Integrated Learning Coordinator at the School of Business and Law at Edith Cohen. Uh, and she's an, also a national board member and the Western Australian State Chair for the Australian Collaborative Education Network, ASEN, which is the National Association for Will. And some of you may be aware that we hosted the ASEN conference here at Macquarie late last year. <laughs> Denise is also an editorial board member for a number of higher education journals, an active researcher in graduate employability, career management, work integrated learning and graduate employment. Denise, the stage is yours. Thank you and good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be here at Macquarie and to see what the PACE team um, are doing in the world space, and they are certainly considered forerunners um, in the world community. Um, so my brief is to give a bit of an oversight um, or an overview of um, how Will impacts on employability. Um, so just the landscape of employability itself, um, very much this has been dominated by the human capital perspective, where we all believe that if... Um, non-technical skills and technical expertise are developed in our students. They will be able to operate successfully in the workplace um, and they will succeed in the labour market. Um, and as a result of that perspective, we've had a very big focus in recent years on identifying which skills are important in our students um, and are desired by graduates, uh, sorry, by graduate employers, um, how we can develop them and framing them into various um, institutional frameworks and then embedding them um, into the curriculum. Um, sorry. Okay, so curriculum mapping exercises have been quite, um, have dominated the higher education landscape um, in recent years as a result of this perspective. So more recently, the concept of graduate employability has broadened um, to encompass some of these different areas which are noted here. Um, and I think really it's more about um, not just about upskilling students in non-technical skills, but developing a whole range of different areas which are quite dynamic and quite interactive. So just focusing on the top part of the diagram there, you've got the the human capital perspective. And this, draws, this, this model draws on the work of Leonard Holmes, who, has, uh, who argues that there are three different aspects to employability. And first is possession, so that aligns with human, human capital perspective. So if you've got the non-technical skills and you've got the technical skills, then you will do well in the workplace and you will succeed and you are employable. Um, the, as you move around clockwise, you've got the other areas of employability, which is the process element which Leonard Holmes talks about. And that is where, um, if the students, students can develop these different areas, they will be able to better transition from university to the workplace. So one of those you can see is the ability to transfer skills across different contexts. Another one just below, you've got is career self-management. Um, this is, there's been increasing focus on the importance of this in recent years, and largely that's been attributed to the change um, in the world of work. So gone, um, or largely gone, is the organisational career instead where um, it's been replaced with a situation where graduates are in charge of their own careers, they have to learn how to self-manage their careers, they have to um, manage multiple jobs, horizontal career progression, um, and be able to identify opportunities and know how to pursue them, which is quite different from, well, certainly from when I graduated. And some of us will, some of us will reminisce back to the graduate program where you have formalised training, um, rotation programmes and long inductions, and it all seems to be quite different to that. Um, there's been a demise in that in recent years. Um, another aspect which, again, is um, attracting growing interest is professional identity. Um, we, it's largely assumed that students will emerge from university, go into the workplace, and they will know where they fit in the economy and in that particular workplace. They will understand about professional values, they will understand about professional etiquette, and they will know how to behave in a workplace, which is quite, if you think about it, that's quite a big ask from students who may not have had any exposure to um, the realities of the workplace in previous years. Even a small thing, and we have this with our Will students that go into an office environment, whether they actually need to ask to go to the toilet or not, which is something which you might find quite alien, but if you cast your mind back to the first office job that you had, 
um, then maybe there's you know, a bit more understanding there. So developing a professional identity in students where they understand um, the sense of being a professional and where they fit in the professional world will very much help their um, employability. Um, another area that's received a lot of attention is perceived employability, and that's basically where um, students feel as though they are worthy of graduate employment. So they um, have the skills and capabilities to perform and in, the, in the workplace, and their skills are in demand, and they are, they are worthy of, and, and able to make a contribution. And having that enhanced confidence will improve their employability. Um, practical experience, we'll talk more about, because obviously Will f falls under there, but couple that with life experience. So these things which might be gathered through curriculum activities, extracurricular, co-curricular, all of those different things which will give um, an enricher student, will enhance their employability. That might be gap years, travelling, and these types of initiatives. And then lastly, we move on to um, Leonard Holmes' position aspect of employability, and that really draws on the final um, few bubbles there. And uh, this aligns really with social capital theory, where there are some students that are simply more employable than others because of perhaps the awarding institution that they got their degree from, their social class, the networks that they have, um, the degree to which they're mobile in the labour market, and also other personal circumstances. So all these things combine to um, determine the success of a graduate to make them more employable. So if we look at that and think, okay, well, um, if we, surely if we develop all those things in our students, then they're going to perform well um, in the labour market. So the way I try, tend to visualise um, employability is I see it as a student going on a learning journey across the higher education landscape of practice, so this is drawing on communities of practice theory. You've got all the different communities, some of which are listed there. Um, and here the student interacts during their university years. They interact with the different communities. Sometimes they might just be on the periphery of them. Sometimes they're fully immersed into them. Um, and as an individual, they're responsible for their own journey. However, as educators, um, we are responsible for providing those opportunities to the students so they can interact with the different communities. And that obviously is in collaboration with industry and community. As you can see from the communities that are listed there, we can't do that alone. So once the student's gone on their journey and they are what they consider employable, they've done all the right things, they've um, done all the extracurricular stuff, they've um, done, got their practical experience, etc. So what about the actual employment outcomes? Now, unfortunately, there's a lot of um, interchangeability between, or it's treated as interchangeable between employment and employability. Sometimes people will just talk in the same paragraph and mention those two words as though they're the same thing, which um, unfortunately they're not. So there are things that blur that relationship between employability and um, employment. And first of all, you've got the graduate labour market. Um, there is evidence to suggest, arguably or not, that there is an oversupply of graduates. Um, and that probably isn't going to change any time soon. Um, we've also, there's been a lot of publicity around automation of jobs that traditionally graduates went into, which does raise the question of where are all these new graduates going to go to. Um, multiple jobs, so gone is a job for life, so on average 17 jobs over a lifetime, and again, that might even grow in the future. And also labour market mobility, I mean, certainly being based in Perth, um, when you talk to students, they know that for, for many of them and the disciplines they're in, they have to move to the eastern states to get a job. And I think slowly they're realising that um, actually it might be international moves as well that, that are required. And not everyone is able to do that, so that's another um, factor. Um, there's also some other things which have known to impact the relationship. Social capital, again, this institution you attended, your social networks, your social class... Um, can impact on whether you actually achieve employment or not. And cultural capital, some individuals are just have a cultural background which enables them to just better mobilise their networks um, and speak the language of the graduate recruiter better than, uh, better than others. Um, and also there are inherent biases which are documented in graduate recruitment processes in relation to race, um, gender and social class, which obviously have an impact. So in terms of practical experience, there's been a lot of focus. If you pick up any um, survey of graduate employers of what do they want in their, in their new graduates, um, 
99% of them will mention practical experience, work-related experience, so that's AAGE surveys, GCA surveys, etc. And that practical experience can come in many different forms. So you've got, obviously, employment during term time or during the year. You've got self-organised internships, which might be paid or unpaid, where the student goes off and gets their own um, internships organised and related to, hopefully related to their discipline. And then you've got work-integrated learning. So I know there's lots of you from PACE here, so I don't want to preach to converted, but obviously will comes in different forms. Um, you've got your placement will, which is, some people don't like that term, but it really it's the traditional forms of will, which is your internship, your placements, and your practicums. And then you've got um, your non-placement will, which is innovative models of will, alternative models of will, which are emerging increasingly um, in recent years. And there's a big focus um, on innovative will and um, the different forms that it can come in. Um, and there are some examples up there. I know that you have um, partner panels is a big one in your FBE area, which I'm looking forward to hearing more about later in the week. Um, and you've got client-based projects and um, simulations and this type of thing. You've also got community-based learning, service learning, which is where the students are addressing a specific community need um, and volunteering. So that all falls under um, the will umbrella. So you might be asking, well, what's the superiority of will? Why is it better than the other forms of practical experience? So I've listed up a few things there, but essentially um, that focuses on a few different areas. One is preparation. So for, for a good quality will experience, students will be prepared before they go into their will experience. And there are some student groups that need that preparation more than others. So international students, for example, not only are they going into a professional environment, which is completely alien to them perhaps, but also they need to understand a little bit about Australian workplace culture before they go, into that, go through that process. Um, there, so there's the preparation side. There's also the feedback side. If you're working in the IGA, sacking shelves or whatever you're doing, um, you know, it might not be that you'll be getting the feedback processes or hopefully that are inherent to will. And that's feedback from your workplace peers, that's feedback from the supervisors, and that's feedback from your academic coordinators. And the other key area, which is really what differentiates it from other forms of practical experience, is the integration element. So hence why it's called work integrated learning. You're integrating the practice-based setting the learning that takes place there with what happens in the university classroom. And that's mainly achieved through reflective um, exercises and activities where students consider what happened to them in the workplace, what they encountered in the workplace, um, and, and go through a process of reconciling that, discussing it with peers, with other academics, with other people in the workplace, and learning from that. And they do grapple with that, and it's that grappling that helps them learn. So you might have a situation where a student sees um, something happen in the workplace which doesn't align with their personal values, and they have to learn to manage that. Or they might see something that they've learned in the classroom, a theory in, let's say, HR or whatever it might be, and they see completely different practices happening in the workplace, which they can confuse them. And it's only when they actually sit and think about that critically and evaluate it that they actually learn to manage that and move on from that. So how does will influence employability? And there's a few different ways there that are listed. And the green ticks are very much um, well documented. There is evidence, several studies or many studies out there over recent years that, that show that will has an impact on these different areas. And the, all those are obviously aligned with the model that I showed you earlier. Um, the red ticks is a tick there because it's partially been done, but there's more to be done um, in the actual area itself. So just looking at career management, um, I did some work in the last few years with um, Nick Wilton, who's an academic in the UK, and we focused on three different areas of career self-management. Um, we looked at career choice um, status, which is um, looking at how the, the choices that students make and whether they're happy and satisfied with their career choices. We looked at career planning, which is where they identify career objectives and the pathways and how they're going to achieve them. And then we looked at career management competencies, which is um, a whole range of different competencies or capabilities which enable them to manage their careers. And we, we use the DOTS model there. So things like identifying um, suitable opportunities, assessing whether they are actually suited to them, assessing their own personal strengths and weaknesses, etc. 
And we found that will had a huge impact on each of those three different areas. And I've listed the points, which I won't um, go through because of uh, time. But essentially, it gave them an insight into their career, which no other um, employability intervention seemed to be as rich in terms of their, um, their learning in these, in, these different, in these different areas. And I think the, the advantage of Will really, it gives them insight into their profession or intended profession. And we've had students, um, I'm obviously based in the area of business, where they've walked away from their Will experience after 13 weeks and said, I will never, ever work in an office. Well, you know, that's fine. In a way, that's quite difficult if you're in business. But at least they've learned that. <laughs> at least they've learned that and they know that's not where they want to go, which is more than they knew 13 weeks ago. And better to learn then than to go into a graduate role, etc., etc. So um, it can be um, very insightful. In terms of the other areas, professional identity, there is a growing body of evidence that will influence early stages of professional identity construction. And that's really about understanding uh, what the values are in the workplace, um, code of conduct, how to behave, um, and what's right and what's not right. And Will gives a great insight into that purely because of the exposure. You get, you get to observe professionals and you get to interact with them. Um, also, in terms of technical expertise, yes, you get to get upskilled, you get to practice those skills, but you also get to see the differences between what's happening, as I mentioned earlier, in theory and also in practice. And with non-technical skills, there's a lot of evidence to show that Will does upskill students in key non-technical skills. So, for example, um, communication, team working, and all the core ones. But what it also does is it shows students the benchmark for what's expected of a new graduate to go into a profession, what's needed in those different areas, and also where they're lacking and ways that they can improve in those, in those different skills. Um, in terms of perceived employability, again, there's a lot of evidence to show that will can make students more confident in their capabilities. Sometimes there can be a horrible drop at the beginning of their experience where they realise, oh my God, I've got so much to learn, and I really, they feel quite overwhelmed by that. But usually over the, during the, by the end of their experience, and actually evidence shows that the longer the experience, the better, or the more episodes of will they have, the better in terms of confidence. But usually the outcome um, is positive. Um, in terms of networking, there has been some work done in the area of the influence of Will in terms of building networks, but more focus on internships and placements, and not so much in the alternative models of Will, and there's more work to be done in that area. Um, an ability to transfer capabilities, so this draws on learning transfer theory, which is quite a complex um, theory of, or complex area of education. Um, and yes, it, it would make sense that will students who practice applying their skills in the workplace would do better than others when they graduate and go into the workplace context. But how that actually happens, um, there's more that we need to learn um, in that area. So will enhances employability. So we would expect, therefore, that our will students would do better in terms of their employment outcomes but keeping in mind the blur and the greyness which I discussed earlier. So there is some evidence um, that Will does improve employment outcomes. Most of the studies have been on placement Will, so internships and placements, and there's been positive outcomes there. However, the relationship, again, is not perfect, and there is more empirical examination that's needed. There is surprisingly a lack of study um, in this area, and I think with the national strategy of will that was released in 2015, one of the points, the key points in there, was that we need more hard evidence of how it actually affects employment outcomes. Um, and the reason for the lack of evidence is partly because of the difficulties in tracking graduates, which we all know and love, I'm sure, and also the measures. So we rely heavily, rightly or wrongly, I could get on my soapbox here, but I will try to avoid doing that. We rely heavily on the GDS and the, and the new GOS um, to assess employment outcomes. And I think we all know that assessing graduates four to six months post-graduation is slightly unrealistic. And also some graduates wouldn't define their successes by whether they got a full-time job that could actually be in McDonald's or it could be related to their um, employment. But the fact is that that is probably the bottom line for universities. That is how the league tables are measured and that is how we get rated in stars by University of Australia. So um, it was a shame when the Social Research Centre went ahead with the GOS, which is great at 
capturing the nuances of the contemporary world of work in terms of underemployment and casualised employment, but there's no measure for will in there. And even though some of the universities did put their hand up and advocate that quite strongly, um, it would have made our lives a lot easier if there had been a measure of, did you undertake will and what type of will did you undertake? We'd then be able to evaluate much easier than we actually can at the moment in terms of the impact um, of will. We have done some preliminary analysis in our own institution on the impact of will on employment outcomes. Um, and we, so we took three different cohorts across um, all the disciplines and we looked at elective will only and looked at students who completed will, chose to complete will and those that didn't. And we found quite interestingly that it didn't impact on short term employment outcomes, the four to six months out. But what it did do in both short term and long term is it impacted on underemployment. So those that completed will were more likely to be in what's classed as quality employment and graduate level employment and also employment relevant to their discipline, which was a very positive um, finding. So will obviously has lots of benefits, but there are challenges. Um, and interpretation of will is one of them in terms of, oh, will is internships and placements. No, it's not. It's a whole range of different things where you connect with industry for authentic learning. Another big area of concern is access and equity. And that is really that some groups are, do not have the same access to will as others. Um, and one of them, well, so students of low socioeconomic status, if you're talking unpaid placements, which, you know, a large part of will forms that, they simply aren't able to undertake unpaid place placements because they can't give, afford to give up their own paid employment, clothing, travel costs, childcare, etc. You've also got um, international students. It's well documented that host employers prefer to um, host domestic students rather than international students, so they also can be marginalised. So there are issues there that need to be um, addressed. International will, I understand that PACE, uh, the Macquarie does send students out globally. Um, that's another area that's flagged in the national strategy as something that which we need to be doing, and we're quite poor, weak in that regard in, re in relation to other countries, such as the UK. Concerns for risk management um, and also the quality of provision if you're using third party providers can be a problem. And resourcing will, we all know that resource, uh, will is very resource intensive. To get such a rich learning experience which is very much bespoke and which varies so wildly by discipline and across different student groups, it is kind of inevitable that it's gonna be resource intensive and obviously that creates its own issues, especially in the environment that we're working in. And also managing the black market of will, and I call it the black market because that's those self-organized, unpaid internships which sometimes contravene for work regulations and sometimes are exploitive. So just briefly, um, in terms of overcoming some of those issues and what certainly what Macquarie is doing by um, operating the PACE program, institution-wide embedding of will is honestly, and I know this from being in the ASN community, is something that many universities would have very high on their wish list. It would be a, a dream come true and I think you need to be congratulated and um, and understand the, the privileged position, I suppose, that you're in, where all your students access an opportunity for will. So the access and equity issue is largely being addressed. Um, and also, it's less likely that your students will be undertaking um, self-organised unpaid internships, which can be exploitive if they've got will opportunities or more than one will opportunity as well open to them. And... In terms of other things that are happening, TEXA guidelines are forthcoming, so there'll be more governing of the quality of will. Um, and also government initiatives. There's a big call, we need more government assistance in this space. Um, there are things happening in the UK, such as a degrees apprenticeship, where um, you've got, it's addressing will for low, students of socially disadvantaged students, where they can go through a, a actual working pathway. Um, so it's predominantly will, but achieve their degree at the same time. And also incentives such as we have in the apprenticeship system. Why isn't the government providing more incentives for um, organisations to participate in will? Uh, and attention to industry partnerships is another big focus point um, because they're obviously quite critical to ensuring the success of and the future of will itself. And that's it for me. So hopefully that's given some insight into the influence, the positive influence of will on employability. Thank you.